All right. <clears throat> Tolkien's fairy story essay. I want to pick up with where we left off the other day. I'm trying to arrange this camera so that it gets all of that. Um, pick up with where we left off the other day, which should be, if you downloaded the same one I have, page 15. It's in the section on children, and it's just before um, the section on fantasy. I actually want to read a little bit of this as we, um, as we discuss it. The paragraph that begins, if we use child, this is a, a really important paragraph. If we use child in a good sense, it has also legitimately a bad one. We must not allow that to push us into the sentimentality of only using adult or grown-up in a bad sense. It has also legitimately a good one. Process of growing older is not necessarily allied to growing wickeder, though the two do often happen together. Children are meant to grow up and not to become Peter Pan's. Now, I think that that last line is especially important. Children are meant to grow up and not become Peter Pan's. Because if you've seen, for example, Peter Pan films, okay, you almost get this implication that it is better to be Peter than it is to be Wendy and her brothers when they go back to their parents. Okay? Because after all, what kind of life does Peter live? Carefree, full of adventure, you know, raiding Captain Hook, you know, never really at risk of death, always just playful, all right? So when Tolkien begins that passage, if we use child in a good sense, it has also legitimately a bad one. What's the bad sense of child? No experience. What would one of you hate to have a parent say to you today in your early 20s? Don't act like a child. Okay? Why? What does that mean? You are a child of them. Doesn't mean you're... So in what context is that used? Or how is it used? Don't act like a child means what? Anybody. I'm not, this isn't rocket science. Immature. Yeah. Don't act immature. Don't act unresponsibly. Okay? So he says we can't let that push us into the sentimentality of only using adult or grown up in a bad sense. And this is, oh, what film kind of makes the break line? This kind of characterizes the early Steven Spielberg. You know, the Spielberg of E.T. as an example. Or the Spielberg even of Close Encounters of the Third Kind. How many of you have seen E.T.? Most of you have. How many of you saw the original E.T. before it was re-digitally mastered and they removed things and added things? Okay. How are government agents portrayed in E.T.? Evil. How else? They're kind of scary. Kind of scary. From what perspective does the camera often shoot them? So lower. Lower. Looking up. You often don't see, for example, heads and such. Okay. And if you saw the original before it was redone, when the government agents go and raid the little kids, I don't remember his name, go and raid his house, what are they carrying with them? Guns. Automatic weapons. Or semi-automatic weapons, in some cases. What are they carrying in the remastered version? Anybody remember? about the, the most frightening things known to humanity. 
clipboards. <laughs> Why? Because Spielberg goes off on this anti-gun mentality. Okay? So Tolkien's point here is we can't think of adult as only being bad. If we think of child, don't act childish, as meaning don't act immature, then we can't say that a grown-up necessarily means you got to go to the other end of the extreme. Jaded, cynical, pessimistic, skeptical. It's not what it means. Okay? So, the process of growing older is not necessarily allied to growing wickeder. Though the two do often happen together. Tolkien suggests there that it is possible to grow older and still remain what? Somebody give me a term so I don't plant one in your minds. Imaginative? What else? What do children tend to have that adults don't as much of? Imagination? Innocence, purity. I mean, we do think of children as pure. We used to. <laughs> okay. But we don't often tend to think of adults as being pure, unsullied, clean. Okay. Children are meant to grow up and not to become Peter Pants. And then he explains what he means by children are meant to grow up. Not to lose innocence and wonder, but to proceed on the appointed journey. What journey? Life. Life. That journey upon which it is certainly not better to travel, hopefully, than to arrive. And now you have to unpack the sentence. What does he mean there? What's the point of the journey? Is it to travel full of hope? No. What do you do if you head out of your apartment, your dorm, whatever, and you're going to the store? What's the point of that trip? To get to the store. Is the point of the trip to get in your car and just kind of get lost? <laughs> no. Is the point of getting in the car to travel full of hope? No. The point is to get whatever you need from the store and go back. Okay? That's Tolkien's point. The point of the journey is the ultimate destination. Whatever that destination may be. So, that's what he means when he says, it is certainly bet not better to travel, hopefully, than to arrive. Though, okay, big clause, we must travel, hopefully, if we are to arrive. In other words, we must have hope that we're going to arrive. How many of you would get up and begin some project if at the outset you had no hope of achieving it? How many of you would, you know, take this class, enroll in the university, if you had the mentality from the very beginning I'm going to flunk out. I'm too stupid. I will never pass any of these classes. Nobody would. Nobody would keep coming. That's what he means when he says, we must travel hopefully. He's using that word in its literal meaning. Full of hope. Because if you're not full of hope, if you're full of the opposite of hope, what are you full of? Despair. Despair. A despairing person never goes anywhere. A despairing person never achieves anything. We'll talk about that quite a bit when we get to the Lord of the Rings. Because Gandalf has an awful lot to say about despair. All right? But it's one of the lessons of fairy stories. If we can speak of the lessons of things that do not lecture. Big, big difference here between Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. Lewis likes to lecture. And I don't, I don't mean that negatively. I don't mean that in the sense that, you know, everything Lewis writes, he's trying to beat some, you know, Christian idea in your head. Because he's not. 
Tolkien thought he was, but he's not. But Lewis is much more of a moralist than Tolkien is. Tolkien just wants to tell a really, really good story. Whether the story ultimately means anything, I think is probably more up to the individual than it is to Tolkien. Lewis means something. It, that's clear. Every one of his books, you know, has a basic idea behind it. So, Tolkien goes on. It's one of the lessons of fairy stories that on what? Callow, lumpish, and selfish youth. Okay. Young people who are callow, lumpish, and selfish. Okay, so they're somewhat self-absorbed. They are lumpish, meaning they're not fully defined. They're not fully formed yet. They're kind of like a blob of clay that the master artist hasn't yet fully formed. Okay? That on that kind of individual, what can happen? Peril, sorrow, and the shadow of death can bestow dignity and even sometimes wisdom. So notice what he is suggesting fairy tales need to include peril, sorrow, and the shadow of death. Okay? Think of the Disney versions of fairy tales. How many of them really, I mean really, include peril, sorrow, and the shadow of death? Snow White. Snow White, Pinocchio. Nothing. Is, is Pinocchio really in danger of dying? No. Is Snow White? No. Is Cinderella? No. Is Sleeping Beauty? No. Is Ariel? No. Is, you know, go all the way, you know, through every stinking one. You know exactly how they're going to work out. Okay? How many of you have read Grimm's fairy tales? The original. Okay. Cinderella? Peril? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorrow? Mm -hmm. Shadow of Death? Yep. Sleeping Beauty? Same thing. Rumpelstiltskin? Mm -hmm. That's not... Grimm's, okay? I mean, look at the originals and then look at the stupid Hollywoodized versions of them, okay? There's a huge difference. Why? Well, different mentalities for different periods. The Hollywood versions, the Disney versions, all come from the late 1930s and later. When do the Grimm's versions come from? <laughs> Who knows? I mean, the Grimm's collected them in the early 19th century. The tales, by the time the Grimm's got hold of them, were probably at least 500 years old. Who were they being told to? Children? No. No. Us. You know, and if they do go back even longer than that, if they do go back, let's say, to... 500 to 1000 AD, then they're being told, sitting around the, the Mead Hall fires, okay, and being sung, like Beowulf was, like Sir Gowan and the Green Knight was, to some extent, okay, and they are told as means of teaching lessons. Yeah, would there be children around? Sure, there would be some, okay, but they were meant for us. So when he says, that if we can speak of the lessons of fairy stories, that on callow, it is one of the lessons of fairy stories, excuse me, that on callow, lumpish, and selfish youth, peril, sorrow, and the shadow of death can bestow dignity. In other words, it can get them to focus on something other than themselves. And often, Tolkien doesn't say this, but often what we see happen in fairy tales is that it is on the callow, lumpish, selfish youth in the stories themselves, it 
people gain dignity and wisdom. Okay? Think of, you've all read, almost all of you have read the Harry Potter novels. Think of Harry Potter. Think of him from the beginning of the first novel to the end of the seventh novel. How does Harry change? Or does he change? Okay. Think of another character. Think of Ron Weasley. How does Ron change? Or even better yet, think of Dudley. How does Dudley change? Books one through six, he's pretty much a rotten SOB. <laughs> book seven, however, something has happened between the end of book six and the beginning of book seven. And that something has something to do with here he saved his life. Dudley now sees the world in a different way than he did before. He understands the world doesn't exist for what purpose? Him. He's not the center. Callow, lumpish, selfish, peril, sorrow, shadow of death. Shadow of death. He almost died or had his soul sucked out. Okay. Did he receive some dignity? Yes. Because if you look at it, where is it? Um, beginning of book six, when Dumbledore comes to collect Harry. Everybody familiar with the scene? Dumbledore invites himself in because Vernon won't. Dumbledore pulls the couch out to make them all sit down. He pours drinks because Vernon won't. Vernon has poor manners. And then Dumbledore says, I asked you to do certain things for Harry, and you didn't do any of it. Instead, you neglected him, you treated him poorly, but at least you never mistreated him the way you did the unfortunate boy sitting between you. And Vernon and Petunia are like, what? And Dudley's like, huh? <laughs> he doesn't have a clue what he's talking about. Because what's Dudley's life normally? Well, book one, how many presents does Dudley get for his birthday? It's 36. 36. Nah, it's 37. More than that. It's 39. He has 37. And Petunia says, we'll get two more. Now you can work that out, can't you, Dudley? He's, uh, you know. Okay. <laughs> And you can only assume he gets that on his 11th birthday, so what's he get on his 12th? And then his 13th, and then his 14th. He spoiled out the wazoo. And Dudley doesn't have what Harry does have. Something that the false Professor Moody tells Harry he has in spades in book four. Character. Strength of character. Okay, we'll talk about where that comes from later. So, Tolkien goes on. If fairy story, next paragraph. If fairy story, as a kind is worth reading at all, it is worthy to be written for and read by adults. Okay, worthy to be written for and read by adults. They'll, of course, put more in and get more out than children can. If any of you have little brothers or sisters who have read the same books you have, you undoubtedly appreciate the book more, if it's a book you really like. You appreciate it more, and you understand it more. You see more in it. Okay, I can read these, these books, and I will see more in it than you guys will. For the simple reason, one, I'm 51 and you're not. I've lived more than you have. Two, I've been teaching them for 15, 20 years. Some of them, at least, uh, the Tolkien stuff. Okay? No. As a branch of genuine art, children may hope to get fairy stories fit for them to read, and yet within their measure. As they may hope to get suitable introductions to poetry, history, and the sciences. Though it may be better for them to read some things, especially fairy stories, that are beyond their measure rather than short of it. What does he mean, beyond their measure? 
Yeah, too hard. Tolkien is, and, and what he says here just utterly flies in the face of what you will hear in most elementary schools. He is saying it's probably better for children to read things too hard for them than things that aren't hard enough. You know, the whole accelerated reading list stuff. Which, you know, you take the stupid little star test, which says you can read, say you're in sixth grade, you can read from a 4.2 to a 7.3 grade level. Now, if you went to the schools my kids went to, it depends upon the teacher, but some of the teachers would say, well, if the star test says you can read at a 7.3 grade level, that means you cannot read a book that is rated 7.4. That is utterly asinine. Okay? Just completely <clears throat> stupid. Because my kids, being children of an English professor, all read way above. And so I, you know, have my son or my daughter, you know, at sixth grade, reading at a ninth or tenth grade reading level, and their teachers or librarians would say, no, 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 you can't read that. You can only read drivel. <laughs> okay? Tolkien saying... Give them the Hobbit and not the Goosebumps series. <laughs> okay. He says their books like their clothes should allow for growth. And their books at any rate should encourage it. So, very well then. If adults are to read fairy tales, fairy stories, as a natural branch of literature, that is, fairy stories are like Plays, they're like poems, they're like short stories, they're like novels, they're just another kind. He says, if adults are to read them, neither playing at being children, nor pretending to be choosing for children, nor being boys who would not grow up, what are the values and functions of this kind? Why does he include the item within dashes? Neither playing at being children, like the uh, guy in California last year, who you may or may not have heard of this, um, a guy in California last year who hit the news stories because he said he had a disability. And his disability is that he wanted to... <clears throat> Yeah, if I remember right, it was about 300 pounds. <laughs> and he, he was a good woodworker because he built himself, I mean, a crib, a real crib, okay? And he lived with a woman, but he also, he lived with a woman and she bottle fed him. This guy's like 30 years old. That's, I'm not kidding. That's better than what I could have been. Well, yeah. <laughs> but he was collecting social security. Okay, he was obviously qualified to work because he built this crib. All right. When word got out, you know, a couple of senators said, uh, "No, <laughs> this is fraud." Okay, and they tried to have his disability. He eventually got his disability back. I'm from California, only in California. Okay. <laughs> playing at. He was pretending to be a child. Why? No cares, no worries, no concern. He didn't have to work because the government took him. And he, I mean, he literally had his little snuggy blankie and, you know, the whole nine yards. He had diapers. He had, okay. So that's one thing. Not playing at nor being children. Nor pretending to be choosing for children. Somebody just, you know, read something to pretend to be choosing for a child. Yes. When the Harry Potter stories first came out, when the first Harry Potter novel came out in England, um, it wasn't an immediate bestseller. Bloom very little marketing for it because they, they didn't think it was going to sell. I, nobody thought it was really going to. You know, J.K. Rowling was turned down, I think, 26 times. Imagine being those acquisitions editors. <laughs> who did Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Okay? 
Um, when the first novel came out, and it, you know, word of mouth spread, a kid would read it, he'd love it, he'd mention it to his friend, his friend would ask his mom, his mom would buy it for him, blah, 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 blah. Parents, you know, because kids were loving it, parents wanted to know what's so good about the story. And they started reading them. By the time the film was out, it still wasn't this huge marketing success or marketing um, phenomenon. But it, they were very well known. People would ride the tube in London or ride the train in England or get on a bus and they would take a book and they would put it in a newspaper. <laughs> there's, there's newspaper accounts of this. Because they did not want to be reading a children's story. Okay? It's one of the reasons why Bloomsbury early on came out two different versions. The child's version with the colorful cover and the adult version with pretty much a solid cover with the title in small print so that people could read it, but other people over here couldn't read what the cover was. When I was a graduate student, uh, I had the flu or something one day, and I went to the, the um, clinic our wife was pregnant with our first child, and because she was pregnant with our first child, I was reading Winnie the Pooh, because I, I hadn't read Winnie the Pooh in I don't know, 10, 15 years at least, and I wanted to reacquaint myself with Pooh and Piglet and Eeyore and, you know, the whole nine yards. The whole and so I get in the, the um, exam room, and the doctor comes out, and she kind of looks at me, and here I am, I'm reading this big, massive, this book, big Winnie the Pooh, and she kind of looks at me and she goes, well, that's not an ordinary reading choice for a university student. Oh, I'm doing some research. That's what I said. Doing some research. Why? I didn't want her to think I liked Winnie the Pooh. I'm, I am 20, sheesh, how old was I then? No, I was 30, or almost 30, you know, and, and I'm reading Winnie the Pooh. I mean, what in the world? That's what Tolkien's talking about, okay? Nor being boys who wouldn't grow up. What are the values and functions of this kind? What are the values and functions of this kind of literature? He says that's the most important question. I ended at some of the answers. If written with art, okay, that is, if well written, value of fairy stories will simply be that value which as literature they share with other literary forms. But he never says what that prime value is. That's why when, you know, I teach a course every May, it's the 2030 course, um, which is now called the experience of literature. Okay, It used to be called the appreciation of literature just an idiotic title for a course because we on this side of the desk can't teach you how to appreciate literature. We can teach you about literature. We can teach you about how literature works. Whether or not you appreciate it, it's entirely up to you. That is, whether or not you value it, that's entirely up to you. Because I can tell you right now, if, if we, if I put a sonnet up on the poem and we spend a class period Taking apart that sonnet, looking at its meter, looking at its rhyme scheme, looking at its sounds, the odds are you're not going to appreciate it. You're going to know what it means, but you're not going to appreciate it. Why? Because I just ripped the stupid thing apart. G Gandalf quote. Gandalf tells Sarah Man, those who would take a thing apart to know what it is, the path of wisdom. Okay? You need an example of that from Tolkien's life. Look at what he says in the Beowulf essay that I mentioned the other day. Because prior to Tolkien, the way people read the old English poem Beowulf was as a mine. M-I-N-E, like a gold mine, a diamond mine. What is a gold mine for? What is a diamond mine for? To get gold and diamond 
Do you care about anything else with the mind? No. Do you care about the rock? Do you care about the dirt? No. It's all to get the gold and diamond. We read Beowulf as a mine of information about ancient Germanic culture. So it was read just to see what the ancient Germanic people said about swords or gift giving or the role of women or whatever. They didn't as a poem about a man who fights monsters and then dies. And Tolkien said, you idiots, this poem is about the monsters. That's why he titled it The Monsters and the Critics. Because all of the critics prior to Tolkien said, they're monsters. Well, everybody knows there aren't real monsters. Push the monsters aside. Let's focus on the Germanic culture instead. Tolkien said, no, 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 no. You got to put the monsters back front and center. Because that's what the entire poem is about. And if you want to understand the meaning of the poem, then try to figure out what Beowulf is doing in the monster fights and what the poet is suggesting through the role of the monsters and such. Okay? So, the value of fairy stories is that value which they share with all literature. Whatever that value is. It's been the remainder of the semester just trying to figure that one out. Why do you read? You all said you read Harry Potter. Why did you read it? Fun? That's a value. Why else? How many of you have read it more than once? How many of you have read it? Okay, now we're going to get real nerdy. How many of you have read it more than five times? How many of you have read it more than ten times? What about just That's ten? Okay, or ten's good enough. How many of you have read The Lord of the Rings more than once? Five? Ten? Okay. I'm probably going on, I don't know. 40. <laughs> okay. Christopher, Christopher Lee, the guy who plays Sarah Man in the films, has read The Lord of the Rings every year since they were published in 1954. He's a real Tolkien diehard <laughs> believer. Okay. So Tolkien says, but in addition to that prime value which all literature has, fairy stories other literature doesn't. And he says they offer in a peculiar degree or mode these things. Now notice, these things that he's talking about aren't necessarily things in the stories for the individuals, the characters in the stories to experience. Okay? These are things for us outside the stories to experience. They offer fantasy, recovery, escape, and consolation. And he says, these are all things that children, generally as a rule, have little need of. I mean, think about it. Does a seven-year-old really need help developing a fantasy life? No. Go for a walk with a seven-year-old or a five-year-old. They'll pick up a rock, and that rock will be the most amazing thing in the world. Or they'll pick up a piece of garbage, like a bottle cap. I used, you know, I'd take my kids for walks, someone, and I'd say, put it down, Daniel. It's junk. <laughs> Go into their rooms, and they're filled with junk, you know, detritus from their early lives. They hold on to them. Why? Because they have meaning, okay? So he says, children have little need for fantasy, recovery, escape, and consolation. Now, maybe when Tolkien was writing this in 1938, that was true. I've come, kind of come to the belief that in our world, you know, I think kids today do have need of recovery. They do have need of consolation because far too many children aren't allowed to live, to live children's lives because of parents pushing them to grow up too fast. And I don't mean pushing them to grow up too fast and that they want them to be a doctor or lawyer or president or something like that, but pushing them to grow up to be too fast in the sense of so regimenting their lives that they have no time for really free play, just free imagination. No, you've got soccer practice, you've got music lessons, you've got Boy Scouts, you've got this, you've got that. 
it's no wonder that by the time, you know, a kid reaches 15 or 18, you know, they're on Zantac because they've already got an ulcer. I'm not kidding. Okay. So he says, we're going to look at these things in order. And he starts with fantasy. And he's going to explain what he means. Okay. Because we all know what fantasy means. We can say, yo, oh, I have a fantasy, which means something that hasn't been lived out, something that hasn't been born out in reality. And we read about fantasy. Somebody has this fantasy of becoming president or this fantasy of becoming a famous basketball player or this, etc. Okay? So he talks about the difference between fantasy and imagination. Imagination is that faculty, that, that being able to create an image in the mind. Maybe the image is of something that is not real. Maybe the image is of something that is a combination of things. Maybe, you know, this dog that's here, you could create an image of that dog with the head of a cat. And rather than a tail, the tail feathers of a turkey. Okay? I've just put an image in your mind of a dog with a cat's head and tail feathers. Don't tell me that's not weird. <laughs> okay? So he says, everybody does this. We all come up with images. Unfortunately, not all of us are a Tolkien or a J.K. Rowling. It's not fair, right? <laughs> so, we have to go from mere creating an image to what we have in our hands in terms of the finished product, the book, the story, the play, the film, the musical score, etc. And Tolkien calls that sub-creation. That going from up here to down here. Every one of you will become a sub-creator this semester. Every one of you will create. Do I have it up there? Yeah. A secondary world. Hopefully inside which I can repose myself for a while. In fact, you'll do that more than once. You'll do that at least three times. Those are your papers. Hopefully, it will be such a secondary world that it will believe, be believable while I am in there. That it, there won't be glaring problems that kick me out. Okay? So, everybody who creates, Tolkien says is actually a sub-creator. He uses that word sub, it means below. Why? Tolkien's Catholic. He's thoroughgoing Catholic. He's a believing Catholic. He's a practicing Catholic. At church every week. All right? There's only one creator. Everything we create with, whether I'm talking about a paper, whether we're talking about a computer, a novel, a story, work of art, etc., what are we using? Stuff that already exists. You don't sit there and go, uh, you know, imaginatio, and you create something that never existed before. Even if you come up with hobbits, what do you come up with? Yeah. You've taken something that exists and modified, changed, shaped, etc. So, looking at this he says that fantasy takes you come up with the image or the imagination you have that idea up here and, but you want to bring it out here into the real world okay the bringing it out into the real world is this okay let me use Peter Jackson I would say as an Peter Jackson's good he's a good filmmaker he's just not a good interpreter of Tolkien in my opinion Okay. Cinematography. Fantastic. As a screenwriter, he stinks. Because he and his wife think they are better writers than Tolkien. All right? So you get the idea, you work the art out, and you get the secondary world or the final product. Maybe it's a song. Maybe it's a painting. Okay? This, in order for it this, what Tolkien calls fantasy, 
needs to have two aspects to it. Arresting strangeness, in a whole there lived a hobbit. Oh, excuse me? <laughs> there lived what? What's a hobbit? Okay. You get arresting strangeness in the open of the hobbit. All right. And it has this quality of enchantment. And Tolkien's going to talk quite a bit about, we're not going to focus on all of it. Okay. But he, he differentiates between enchantment and magic. And here's why. Enchantment has as its goal shared enrichment. That is, the enrichment of the author or sub-creator with the participant, the audience, the reader. Okay, now, what does that mean, shared enrichment? It means we participate and we come away from this secondary world changed, transformed, improved, bettered. All right? The difference between that and magic, enrichment and magic, is that magic is all about domination. Okay? Magic is all about control. In fact, he says, uh, he's talking about the word spell. And he says, it's no wonder that the word spell meant originally two things. One, a story told. And two, a word of power or word of control. And he talks about the difference between the enchanter's <coughs> art and the magician's. Okay? The magician, he says, wants domination of wills and things. Who's our classic example in this class? <coughs> Sauron in Lord of the Rings and Voldemort. Does, does Voldemort ever turn down an opportunity for power? No. I mean, what does... Um, Professor Quirrell say at the end of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Harry's finally figured out it's not Snape after all. It's Quirrell. And Quirrell says, you know, when he was young, he was foolish, and he, he left school, and he went and traveled, and that's when he met his master. And what did his master teach him? There is no such thing as good and evil. There's only power. There is only power in those too weak to seek it. Not those strong enough to wield it. Those too weak to seek it. It's not an accident that she gives us that little line at the end of the very first volume. Because all of the other volumes are going to be about power. Who seeks it? Who wants it? Who doesn't? Okay? So... The magician is all about power, because what does the magician want to do? The magician wants to alter the laws of the world. The magician wants to say, levitatio, you know, to defy the laws of gravity. The magician wants to say, imperio, take away another's will, or avada kedavra, take away another's life. The enchanter, however, or... The sub-creator wants to say, come here, look at this. you got to see, this will totally blow your mind. This is amazing. It, that individual wants to spread, wants to share something deeper, truer, more beautiful, etc. Okay? So Tolkien goes on, and he says there on page 16, like I said, we're probably not going to finish. He says there on page 16, right in the middle of the page almost, fantasy has an essential drawback. It is difficult to achieve. <coughs> How difficult? How many of you are avid fantasy readers? One. Okay, a few. Okay. Anybody else come close to Tolkien? 
No. Why not? Because there's only one token. Okay, yeah. Other than that. A lot of them take parts of tokens. Yeah. Like A lot of them are nothing but cheap Chinese knockoffs. <laughs> they take the model and they say, oh, here's a model. I'll follow this. I'll change some names. I'll add some plot devices. And it is essentially the same story. A big bestseller in the 1970s that the author went on to write like, I don't know, seven or ten volumes in the series, okay, was a series of books by a guy named Terry Brooks. The Sword of Shannara was the first one. It came out in 1977. The Sword of Shannara was an immediate, big, huge bestseller. Okay. But a lot of Tolkien folks said, what a piece of crap this is. This is just entirely a knockoff of the Lord of the Rings. You have a group of quests. They've got to find something or destroy something. You've got a magician. You've got a man. You've got two men, actually. You've got these little half-elven people. You've got a who's actually a gnome and a few others. And the, wiz the wizard is a druid. Okay. Anybody read Sword of Shannar or the Shannara series? I feel like there's a reason we haven't heard that name before. I mean, it's, it's still huge. You go to any bookstore and there's, you know, almost an entire Terry Bookshelf. The name of the wizard is Alanon. Now, you have to have lived in the 70s to get that. Alanon, think of it as this way. Alanon was the name of a drug group in the 1970s, like Alcoholics Anonymous. It wasn't alcohol, this was a like, prescription drug, okay? So that a lot of people said, how lame can you be to come up with a name like that? Well, it's because Brooks isn't taken. <laughs> Brooks didn't spend his lifetime essentially writing the stories that developed into this, okay? I read very little fantasy for the simple reason that so much of it does seem to be derivative of Tolkien. Does that mean Tolkien, you know, did something totally new? Nope. Tolkien had his precursors. George MacDonald in the 19th century. G.K. Chesterton to some extent, even though Chesterton had the kind of fantasy Tolkien does. Old Norse, Beowulf, King Arthur, all of that material go into the cult language that Tolkien uses, out of which he then, you know, draws ladle after ladle to create the Lord of the Rings and such. Okay? What else? He goes on and talks about how you make a secondary world believable. Is J.K. Rowling's world believable? Yes. Does it just seem totally natural when you're reading J.K. Rowling that you ought to be able to go up to a fireplace, throw some flu powder in, say where you're going, and whoop, hop in? Yes! It makes totally perfect good sense, okay? Tolkien says, to make a secondary world inside which the green sun will be credible, commanding secondary belief will probably require labor and thought and will certainly demand a special skill, a kind of elvish craft. Few attempt such difficult tasks. Okay. He had already had that difficult task with the hobbit. Is The Hobbit like The Lord of the Rings? The story, the novel, not the films. No. Why not? How are they different? Hobbit goes from place to place, kind of very okay. linear. Okay, what else? What about the atmosphere of the stories? Lord of the Rings is more like epic. Lord of the Rings is much more epic. What else does the Lord of the Rings have that the Hobbit doesn't? I'm thinking more attitude or atmosphere. It's a lot lighter. The Lord of the Rings? No, the Hobbit. The Hobbit's light. It's airy. It's fluffy. The Hobbit, if you think of cooking, the Hobbit's like a meringue. <laughs> okay? Lord of the Rings, it's a roast, man. It's meaty, and you got to dig through that.
Okay. Baha'u'llah meant to be light and airy and fluffy. Compare the elves and the hobbit with the elves in the Lord of the Rings. What is our first experience of the elves and the hobbit? Not the film. Idiot. <laughs> <laughs> what are they doing when the elves make their way down into Rivendell? Singing what? Do they sound like the dwarves? They're not sonorous, you know, deep and... No, they're singing tra la 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 lolly the elves in that valley, tra la 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 lolly hip hi ho merry a you know. It's nonsense. It's like, you know, the munchkins in Wizard of Oz. They're not very serious. But in Peter Jackson's version, they are. They're very serious. It's like they have no levity to them. Elrond is not the same. Elrond from The Hobbit to The Lord of the Rings. Yes, the character is the same. But something happens between 1937 and 1954. World War II is one thing that happens. And Tolkien's whole conception modifies. And he sees how what was started in the Lord in the Hobbit, when he comes with the ring, that takes him back to the earlier stories, the stories that long predate the Hobbit. Anybody, anybody in here read the Silmarillion? A couple. How different is the Silmarillion from even the Lord of the Rings? It's darker yet. Why? Well, because it begins with the beginning of the world. You know, how evil and pain and all that kind of stuff enter the world and how they are repeatedly played out generation after generation. The Lord of the Rings is kind of dark. Man, the Silmarillion. They're, just when there's about to be a really nice thing happen, everybody dies. <laughs> it's, it's pretty much how it is. Okay? So, few attempt such difficult tasks. But when they are attempted and in any degree accomplished, then we have a rare achievement of art. Indeed, narrative art, story making in its primary and most potent mode next sentence. In human art, fantasy is a thing best left to words. True literature. Not film. You, you know why Peter Jackson can even People don't want to read it. No. <laughs> Good guess, but no. Okay, now I'm even, I'm, my why goes back even farther than that. Because Tolkien sold the rights. And there was only one reason why Tolkien sold the rights. From about 1957 on, he had filmmakers saying, Tell us the rights, let us make a movie out of it. And he's like, no, are you crazy? Uh-uh. And he finally did, for one reason. He had a huge tax bill that he had to pay. And he sold the rights for today would be a penny. I mean, it, I think it was uh, like 10,000 pounds. Which is why Christopher Tolkien, his son and literary executor, has absolutely no control, no say, over what happened in the Lord of the Rings films or The Hobbit. None whatsoever, which is also why he would never make any comment about them. He figured, I can't do any good. Okay, But it's also why Peter Jackson cannot refer to anything other than what exists in the physical volumes. The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Or to anything that's found anywhere from the cover to the cover. But he can't refer to anything that shows up, for example, in the 12-volume History of Middle-Earth. Or Book of Lost Tales, or Unfinished Tales, or Unfinished Tales, uh, Book of Lost Tales 2. He can't refer to any of that. He can only refer to what actually shows up in The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings films. Okay, Because Tolkien stipulated that in the contract.
It was only the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit that were sold for film rights. Peter Jackson can never make, unless Christopher Tolkien... Rather large tax. <laughs> no, he won't have a rather large tax bill. He you know, might have a stroke or something, but he said just in the, like the last month, you know, the Silmarillion will not be filmed, period. Peter Jackson wants to, which, you know, put a bullet through that would kill me. So, what's he, what's he said? Fantasy is best left to literature. Why? Why? Because then the reader can picture what they want to picture. Bingo. Because then takes the words and creates the secondary world up here. You go see Peter Jackson's Hobbit, and it will be hard to then read The Hobbit and not have those images. Like today, if I read Lord of the Rings, I see Ian McKellen as Gandalf. I hear, however, a different voice. I hear a voice of another British actor named Michael Hordern, who did a BBC radio version, was the actor for Gandalf in a BBC radio version back in the 70s, which I listened to hear his voice, okay? I can't see Frodo without seeing um, Bug Eye. What's his name? <laughs> yeah, Elijah Wood. Okay. Horrible. Horrible, my opinion, casting. But, you know. So, Tolkien goes on. Fairy and drama. And what he's talking about here is he's talking about these stories from the Middle Ages of people being, seeing fairy abducted by fairies, and he calls it fairy and drama because the people that had these experiences were what? They were enchanted. In other words, they believed that it really happened. Maybe today we'd call these UFO abdu abductions. I have no idea. But Tolkien says, the elves, and he kind of talks about them like they're real. And I was working on an edition of this um, essay for a couple of years. I go to Oxford and get all the manuscripts and copy them all out and stuff. And, and a lot of material doesn't show up. Tolkien kind of sounds like he really believes in elves. I mean, really. Like, they, they are there. We just don't see them. Okay? Um, he says, you know, the elves have this special ability which allows us to believe and he's word for that. So he's going to use that word enchantment, okay? And that's that sheer enrichment idea that we were talking about. And then he goes on and he talks about fantasy. And he says how fantasy plays strange tricks with the world. Some say it does on page 18. And he gives us this, this portion of a, a poem that he wrote to a man, okay? The man said that fairy story making was like breathing a lie through silver. Think, think of that image. Breathing a lie through silver. So the essence is still a lie, but it's now coated with silver. It's beautified. It's still a lie, but it's beautiful. Did Frodo really carry to Mount Doom? No, didn't happen, folks. Sorry, any of you who are true believers. Did, uh, did Luke really kill the Emperor? Or did Darth Vader? No, that's not real. I know a lot of people think it is. No. So if it's not real, then what is it? It's a lie, according to this individual. So Tolkien writes this letter to him and includes this poem. Although no longer strange, lost nor wholly changed. Disgraced he may be, yet is not dethroned and keeps the rags of lordship once he owned. Man separated the refracted light through whom is splintered from a single white, too many hues and endlessly combined in living shapes that move from mind to mind. All the crannies of the world we filled with elves and goblins, Though we dared to build gods in their houses out of dark and light, and sowed the seed of dragons, 
'twas our right used or misused that right has not decayed we know by the law in which we're made the letter that Tolkien writes and this poem is his way of telling the other individual we make because we're made in the image of a maker period we subcreate because we're made in the image of a creator okay Anybody know who he wrote this to? C.S. Lewis. This is before Lewis became a Christian, which largely happened as a result of a conversation Tolkien had with him. Because Lewis, Chronicles of Narnia guy, Lewis essentially thought before he became a Christian, I love fairy tales. I love myths, but they're lies. They're not true. And Tolkien was like, so? <laughs> People make them because there is some deep-seated desire to create. And notice the language that he uses there. Man, sub-creator, the refracted light. What is that? Bent from what? The single white. We individually are all little individual bandwidths of light, okay? That can all be traced back to the single light. So he says, the natural human activity. We can no less have an imagination than we can stop breathing, okay? It's like telling, you know, children in classroom not to daydream. It's like telling them to stop breathing. They can't daydream. He says, fantasy does not destroy or even insult reason. It does not either blunt the appetite for nor the perception of scientific verity. He says, in fact, the opposite is true. The keener and the clearer is the reason, the better fantasy will it make. And then he has this paragraph you need to memorize because it's so good. Or at least the first line and a half of it. Creative fantasy is founded upon the hard recognition things are so in the world as it appears under the sun, on a recognition of fact, but not a slavery to it. Now think of what that means. Creative fantasy, the kind of fantasy Tolkien has talked about, is founded upon the hard recognition that things are so in the world that it appears under the sun. What does that mean? That things are so in the world as it appears under the sun. Yeah, okay, but ex explain more of what that means. How does the world appear under the sun? Lit up? What else? What does it mean under the sun? It means the world that, that we inhabit. Things look in the world. Turn on the news any day. What do we hear? Shit happens. To put it bluntly, you know, what just happened in Algeria? A whole bunch of hostages, people were taken hostage by these Al-Qaeda loonies. And then the Algerian special forces, a misnomer if there ever was one, raided the natural gas complex. And what happened? All hostages dead. Over 83 people. Are those hostages living in a vacuum? No. They were from the United States. They were from Britain. They were from France. They were from Norway. They were from the Philippines. Every one of those hostages has what? A family. And every one of those families has friends. And so what happens? That one event in the middle of the Algerian desert ripples out. Okay. Things so as they appear under the sun. Is this the best of all possible worlds? Is this the way you would make it if you were God? Pain and suffering? Would little kids die of cancer? Probably not. 
which thank God none of us Okay, I will add. But what Tolkien is saying is that we cannot attempt to gloss over. We can't attempt to sugarcoat over the way the world is. Famous British philosopher said, life is human life nasty, brutish, and short. Poor, nasty, brutish, and short, and then you die a very ringing endorsement for life, right? So Tolkien says, creative fantasy is founded upon what? Hard recognition that things are so in the world as it appears under the sun. Why is it hard? Because we would rather be this way. We would rather that there isn't pain, that there isn't suffering. I would that when I drive into work in the morning, that there's not a guy sitting on the corner of West Main Street in the square, all bundled up in clothes because he doesn't have a home to live. I would rather that there aren't people hungry right now. Okay? But my rathering, it were otherwise, doesn't change the world, does it? Doesn't matter a hill of beans. Tolkien says creative fantasy is founded, it's based upon this. Yet, we're going to see in just a few minutes, maybe, what is one of the charges leveled against fantasy literature? It's not real. It's escapist. It tries to say, you know, oh, you can just check out for it. Tolkien is saying just the opposite. Fantasy literature really is the most real, okay? Because it acknowledges how bad things really are. Look at Harry Potter's world. Hermione's a mudblood. Put that in our language. She's a nigger. That's what it means. <gasps> he said the word, okay? That's what it means supposed to imply, okay? It's supposed to have that same kind of gut reaction connotation to it. Well, I thought it was all otherworldly fantasy make-believe, that it didn't deal with any problems. Race, prejudice, dysfunctional families. You, you don't need to go read, you know, Catcher in the Rye. Read Harry Potter the world is. But it doesn't stop there. That's the important thing. It's based upon the hard recognition that things are as they appear under the sun. But what? On a recognition of fact, not a slavery to it. Because what does fantasy always Suggest. And I don't mean suggest in the sense of you get an all knowing narrator who says, but things can be better. Trust in Jesus. You know? How does it suggest things can be better? How does it make things better in his own little world? Don't think Voldemort. It's nothing to do with Voldemort. You know, think first book. Harry and Draco and Hermione get detention. They have to go off into the for Forbidden Forest. They're looking for whatever's killing the unicorns. Harry and Draco are paired up. And they go off and they see something off in the distance. Shiny, it's covered with unicorn blood. Dude, does anybody remember that scene? He and Draco are kind of side by side, and Draco's starting to move forward. And Harry puts his arm out to stop him. Now, I can understand Harry doing that for Hermione or Ron, or Neville, or Fang, <laughs> <laughs> or Dobby, or Draco? He hates Draco. And he's from what? Danger. Danger. 
<laughs> Jump to book seven. Draco's about to get torched. What does Harry do? He rescues him. Okay. What does he do throughout all the books? He stays true to his own character. He's himself <coughs> in danger for others. Where, where in the seven books do we see Harry most focused on himself? Anybody remember? Pardon? Well, at the beginning of Order of the Phoenix, when he's having his you know little fifteen-year-old temper tantrum, and he just needs to be taken out and have the snot beat out of him. Love interest. Okay, it's book seven. They go to Godric's Hollow. He thinks he's going to get all the answers. His wand gets broken, and the next morning it's Christmas Day. He's looking out on this beautiful Scottish countryside, covered in snow, and the narrator says, "And Harry ought to be filled." with this wonder at being alive on such a beautiful day. And instead, it's, oh, poor, pitiful me. Okay? And he's thinking of himself. But what happens every time Harry thinks only of himself? Bad stuff. It's when he runs into somebody else who's at home that they draw him out. Um, Order of the Phoenix, you mentioned. At the end of the Order of the Phoenix, during the end of year feast. What's Harry doing and what's Luna doing? Everybody remember? They're by themselves. Luna's trying to find her stuff that people have hid. And Harry's walking around throwing a pity party for himself. Okay. See somebody again. I won't mention the name just in case. Well, you've all read it. He won't see Sirius again. And he runs into nearly headless Nick, and Nick says, no, you're not going to see him again. Why? He's gone on. Where has he gone on? Mm, can't really answer that. Next question. <laughs> and so here he's dealing with what? Grief? Yes, but what else? Close. Death. He's dealing with what happens when we die? I mean, he asks Nick, what happens when we die? And Nick says, don't know. You mean you don't, you're dead? <laughs> you know, okay. And so he goes off and he finds Luna. And Luna tells him, "People hide my stuff. They think it's funny. Ha ha ha." And she says, "Who did you see die?" And you know. And he says, "Wait, you heard those voices? Who did you see die?" And she talks about her mother. And she tells him, "But it's not ever see her again." And here's like, what? This is Luna, after all, you know, horn crumpled snack corks or whatever they are. And she goes, come on, Harry. You heard the voices just behind the veil. What precipitates that? Harry asks her if she needs any help. In other words, he stops focusing inward. He stops on his own loss. He stops focusing on... The hard recognition that things are so in the world as they appear under the sun. The closest he has to the father is dead. Does he have a right to feel sorry for himself? Yes. Okay. A slavery to it. In other words, that recognition cannot <coughs> define life. Because we see an example of that in the Lord of the Rings. Someone who sees the world as it appears under the sun and is enslaved to that vision. Anybody know who I'm thinking of? No. <laughs> Denethor sees the world as it appears. How does the world appear? To Denethor's perspective. What do the men of Gondor have compared to Mordor. It would be like the United States Army, number-wise, with China's army. How many men does China have in its army? How many people does China have? Let's start there. <laughs> Over a How many do we? About 330 million. They have over a million-man army. 
We've got roughly, if you include National Guard and all that, about 500,000. That's not even an apt comparison because Gondor has maybe 30,000. I mean, they send 10,000 out to storm the gates of Mordor. How many does Mordor have? Probably millions. A recognition would be, we're screwed. <laughs> totally and unconditionally. There is nothing we can do. There's nothing we can do. Okay, We cannot win by arms. Denethor recognizes that what? He's imprisoned by it. He cannot see any hope. So he's full of despair. You can recognize it is a really bad place in terms of there being suffering, pain, and death. But you don't have to succumb to it. Because what can an individual do? Does an individual have pain and death in the world? No. But an individual can give someone who's hungry some food. An individual can. I see all of you are cold, or many of you are, because that thing's probably set on 50. An individual can give someone who's cold a coat. Does that alleviate all the suffering in the world? No. Does it alleviate some? Yes. And that's how it begins. That's what Tolkien means there, by it not being a slave to the recognition of fact. Okay? So he goes on from recovery, escape, and consolation. And I can do recovery really quick because it's easy. What is recovery? A regaining of or seeing as we were meant to see. Well, what does that really mean, though? Tolkien uses the, the example of a Everyone in here is part of a family. Might not be a good family. Might not be the family you'd like to be a part of. But it's a family. Okay? And what do we tend to do with members of our own family? Argue. Protect. Take for granted. So that something, God forbid, happens. <coughs> and a member is away from you. Suddenly, and what often happens? I didn't get to say. Okay, so Tolkien calls that the drab, uh, the trite blur of familiarity, because because my wife and I have been married almost twenty eight years. I don't see her. I don't look at her with the eyes I looked at her when we had six months to go before we were married. Okay, why? Because we've been married for 28 years. I know what she looks like. That doesn't mean, however, when she walks in the room, my blood pressure and my heart rate elevate like they did six months before we were married. Because I own her in my mind, in the way I think and act. And she owns me. Why? We think we belong. So... The individual, the person, becomes like a wallet or a possession that will always be there. And we put it up, you know, on a shelf until something, what, makes us pay attention. That's recovery. Recovery is the paying attention. Today's not a good day because we don't have flowers blooming every. But it's like looking at trees. And Tolkien says, seeing a tree as a tree, not just, you know, a big thing out there. By coming into this room and seeing the room, not just four walls and a roof, but really seeing what it's made out of. Yeah, everybody looks. Cinder block. What do the cinder blocks look like? Are they solid? Are they? No, there's texture. There's little dimples in them. What's the back wall look like? It's paneling. What does the ceiling look like? Solid tiles with no little holes or the kind with holes? It's kind of with holes. It's only when your attention is brought to something, then you start to see. So what is one 
wonderful thing fantasy can do. It can show us something in the world in another world situation. And we go, oh, I see what's going on there. He called her a mudblood. That's like, well, that's not very nice. Or you see a family, Snape's family. Well, look at the kind of upbringing he had. Draco, look at the kind of father he has. Or you look at Dudley. Can you really blame Dudley for being the kind of individual? Okay. All right, when we come back on Thursday, we'll get to Escape and Consolation, which won't take long. So um, 